replied. No, he has said, John has just said we give him a minute. Okay. He said something. Uh, I don't know. It had been there, now it says paused. Recording now. I think we are five minutes after. Oh, cool. Okay, I'll just call him one more time. Just to be sure. Hi, Kenodia, we're waiting for you. Thank you. Sorry about that. So good evening, um, everybody. I'd like to start off by thanking all of you for taking your evening to listen to us as we present to you this work on preterm birth initiative that was done in Kenya. So my name is Nelly Mugo and it's my pleasure um, to, to be able to do this. I'll start off by working on, you know, letting you know what our presentation outline will be. And we'll start off by just reviewing and introducing the topic framing what, what informed the, the, the work that was done, reviewing the study results, and also going through what the package of implementation was. And then the panelists will have a discussion on it and we'll have time for your question and answers. Um, so write your comments in the, in the chat note and we will come to them. And then we'll have the final closing remarks. So. Keep writing your messages on the side. I already said this, I'm your moderator. My name is Dr. Nelly Mugo. I work for the Kenya Medical Research Institute. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist and a clinical research scientist. And I was a member of the PTBI um, investigators team in Kenya. Next, it's my pleasure to um, it's my pleasure to introduce our, our, um, and our, our panel of speakers and my fellow investigators. So the first person I'll be introducing is Professor Dillis Walker, who is the protocol chair for this work. And she is an obstetrician um, gynecologist and reproductive health sciences at the School of Medicine at the UCSF. And she's also a founder director of PRONTO, which was one of the interventions that was used. She served as the principal investigator for this work. Dr. Felgona Otieno, my colleague at Kemri, she served as our principal investigator for PTBI Kenya. She's a pediatrician and a principal research scientist um, at the Center for Clinical Research, Kemri. We may not uh, have Dr. Peter Waiso today, but he, his work will be presented by Dr. Dillis Walker. And um, uh, Peter Weisway is an associate professor of School of Public Health at Makerere University. 
and he served as a principal investigator for PTBI Uganda. As you know, Uganda's having network problems, which is challenging his ability to attend. Next. Um, I think before that, Professor Anthony Wanyoro, my colleague and also a co-investigator for PTBI Kenya is an associate professor of obstetric gynae at Kenyatta University. And he, he led the team on data strengthening and safe childbirth checklist interventions for the study. Then Kevin Achola is a public health practitioner currently working as a research scientist at LVCT Kenya and for PTBI Kenya, he was our program manager. And then Annette Osimbo, also PTBI Kenya is a nurse midwife currently with Kakamega County and for PTBI Kenya, she was the lead for Pronto Mentor. So uh, kindly join me in welcoming our panelists. Um, the next group who will be with us will be the panelists who will be discussing the presentation. Professor Edwin Were, a very senior obstetrician gynecologist from Moy University, who was um, part of the board for PTBI Kenya, Professor Rachel Musoke, renowned Kenyan neonatologist, long-term lecturer, <laughs> University of Nairobi. Unfortunately, she's not able to join us because she's currently in Uganda and they have a network problems. Dr. Wafa Osman, Ministry of Health Kenya, also pediatrician, and I think he's well known to many of us. Dr. Irene Inwani, pediatrician, research scientist, also part of the advisory board and currently Deputy Director of Clinical Services, um, Kenyatta National Hospital. So we have a very strong panel. Next, please. So the, the, the PTBI um, the PTBI protocol, um, sorry about that. The, the PTBI uh, study was complex and used adaptive intervention package uh, as an intervention for preterm survival. And it focused on existing data system and used personnel from the facilities. So PTBI worked in MOH, Ministry of Health Facilities, in um, faith-based organization and used a real world context to intervene and create changes which we'll be hearing about uh, for survival of the preterm. So it's my pleasure to welcome our first presenter who will be Felgona Otieno. Thank you, Nelly. Uh, so I will just dive in on now to give you uh, the background uh, for the project uh, where we worked. Next slide. So just a, bit, a brief glimpse on the, the background and the context where we are working in. Um, as we all know, PTB, uh, preterm birth is a leading cause of infant and newborn and neonatal mortality. As we can see from this slide, if we look at preterm birth together with interpartum related events, both of these actually contribute to over 26% of all uh, under five mortality. And if we are to look at only neonatal mortality, then the contribution is of, of the two exceeds uh, 50%. Next. Next slide. So everyone, every newborn action plan strategic objectives were rolled out in 2014. And these uh, strategic objectives provides um, various ways of interventions to save the lives of all newborns. As part of this strategic uh, uh, plan, we can see that quite a bit of focus is placed on facility-based interventions, especially around labor and immediate uh, birth period. So this is the area in which we invested our interventions around, and we, we targeted this window that uh, we, we, we have mentioned. And the other approach that we did come out with was to actually look at combination rather than using single interventions to save most of the lives. Next. 
Our study was um, a clinical trial. It was um, a trial which was unblinded, pair match cluster randomized control trial. And uh, in Kenya, we as Kemri worked with Migori County and the government uh, Ministry of Health. In Uganda, also again, Makerere University worked together with the, the Busoga region, the district around Busoga, and also with their government uh, Ministry of Health. The interventions were delivered in the facility level and focused on quality of care around the time of birth and immediate postpartum period. As you can see from this slide, both the two regions, Migori and Biso and Busoga, are actually very close in terms of the health indicators. If you are to look at the neonatal mortality rates, still birth rate and preterm birth rates. And even geographically, they are quite close. Next slide. A total of 20 facilities were enrolled and pair matched. The control facilities received two of the four of the interventions, namely data strengthening and modifi modified safe childbirth checklist. And um, the modified safe childbirth checklist focused around, um, let's go back to the previous one first. The control facilities received four, two of the four uh, of the interventions. And the data strengthening was mainly around using maternity register while the safe childbirth checklist was picked uh, from the WHO safe childbirth checklist and modified to be in line with the preterm birth interventions. Next slide. Next slide. So for the intervention facilities, they received the, the, the full package, which was the four. So on top of data strengthening and modify safe childbirth checklist, we had two additional interventions, uh, quality improvement collaboratives and pronto uh, simulation and team training. Yes. So our hypothesis was that the full intervention would reduce combined incidence of fresh stillbirth and neonatal mortality among preterm infants by 30% compared with the control group that had received a partial um, of the package. So as you can see, uh, our theory of change is actually really heavily grounded on quality of care. Next. So um, our primary outcome therefore focuses on uh, looking at combined fresh stillbirth and neonatal mortality up among eligible infants. So how did we define eligibility? So we defined eligibility as infants uh, who are all live or registered fresh stillbirth with a birth weight of 1,000 to 2,500 grams, or if their birth weight was below uh, 3,000 grams, then we looked at the recorded gestational age, which had to be below 37 uh, weeks. So we did this because of the challenges in determining a true preterm in this setting. And this was to help us to pick those who could truly be preterms without investing much effort on those who are outliers. And our, in our analysis, we use intention to treat uh, using logistic regression adjusted for pairing and clustering and using robust standard error estimates. Next slide. So the power of our, uh, of our package then is actually grounded on this issue of the integration in such a way that as you can see, if we were to use only isolated um, intervention, maybe the outcome may not be the same, but using the, the four together, we can see that there's great interaction and synergies between each and every one of these components and this then use, uh, brings out a rather greater impact compared to if you were just to use single interventions. After sharing our results, uh, which are coming soon after this, we will then come back to each of these interventions and, and just dive a little deeper 
to look at how they were implemented and 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 the challenges and and what we think were the, the their areas of strength. Next slide. So we our interventions were all rolled out in a, in a real world setting, and uh, as you can see. Um, these interventions uh, were not all rolled out together. We first of all had data strengthening and safety about checklist coming in as the, as, as the first entrance and later on Pronto and QI were added. And additionally, as you can see in, uh, in Uganda, they were able to complete their study much earlier uh, by December, 2018. While in Kenya, because of the nurses strike that took about eight months, we were not able to complete until May 2019. So just the, the next slide, the next slide is helping us just to see the real world setting where we implemented this work. And uh, these are two pictures and uh, just gives us a glimpse of the environment. So as you can see, the data strengthening, the records can be that disorganized. Uh, if you look at the maternity wards, they can be that crowded. Uh, the delivery rooms can be very, very, it's very hard to have confidentiality, the privacy issue. And even in the newborn units, there's quite a bit of crowding. So that's just to show the real world section. Next slide. So uh, we will then just now welcome Dillis to give us a so, uh, welcome, Dilis. Thank you very much, Shalgona. And let me just tell you and your colleagues and your audience in Kenya, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here with you um, this evening for you, this morning for me, and I appreciate your spending your evening with us. Next slide. I'm, I'm also um, presenting the data that uh, the preference would have been for Peter Wisewood to present, but given the situation in Uganda, um, he's unable to connect. So let me start by sharing with you our consort diagram. Um, as you can, as Felgona mentioned, our outcome was a 28-day outcome among eligible newborns. So how did we get there? We started with 23 facilities that were assessed. Of those, we included 20 facilities we removed the referral facilities. They were unable to be matched and they were not randomized, but we did collect data there. Of the 20 facilities that were then selected, we pair matched them uh, based on delivery volume, uh, uh, preterm volume, neonatal mortality, and we ended up having 10 pairs and half of them were randomly selected to be receive the full intervention package and half were controlled. Among those in those um, facilities, there were many, many births and they all of the full-term births were excluded, all of the macerated stillbirths were excluded, any infants born that were less than a thousand grams were excluded. Uh, then you can see beyond that in each arm, we consented approximately 63% of the eligible infants uh, we'll discuss a little bit that a little later. And then we lost about 13% to follow up. Uh, this left us with almost 1,500 uh, infants to, that were followed in the intervention and control uh, as intervention and control facility births. Next slide, please. This slide just gives you an idea of how our matching was and how good the matching was, which was pretty good. Um, you can see it was based on delivery volume, stillbirth, low birth weight, pre-discharge um, mortality. Uh, next slide. Here we can see across the um, study arms, what were the, the maternal and uh, new infant characteristics in both the control and the intervention facilities. Uh, we can see a relatively expected uh, proportion of adolescent births, uh, low birth weight uh, rate, and that's that high because we're talking among eligible births. Okay, next slide, please. So here is the big headline. 
Uh, when we implemented this intervention package, we found that it reduced the odds of combined fresh stillbirth and neonatal mortality among these small and fragile infants by 34% control to the control group. So what does that mean? That means in the control group, we found that about 23% of the eligible infants were either stillbirths or were not alive at 28 days. Whereas in the intervention group, this was decreased to 15%. Um, this data was adjusted for pairing and for the cluster um, design. We did further adjustments because we were, felt that this was a, a really a striking result. Um, and we further adjusted for those variables that you can see in the slide, things like C-section, twins, country, um, and delivery volume. Next slide, please. If we look at this, we then thought this is a striking result. How is this among um, the different outcomes related to newborns? So you can see uh, that it reduced the mortality odds across all of these, fresh stillbirth, pre-discharge mortality, 28 mortality, perinatal mortality, and the combined one is our primary outcome. What is striking about this, or what, what struck us, was the 28-day mortality piece, because um, when we started out, remember, our intervention is entirely located at facility level. So we were somewhat apprehensive that maybe we would um, effectively intervene for these small and fragile newborns during labor, their first day of life, the early hospital care, but that perhaps there would be um, a bump in mortality following that once they got home. And we found that in fact, the effect lasted out to 28 days. Next one, please. So we wanna recognize that it was a significant finding. There are some important limitations to me mention. I think the first one that I'm sure you're all struck by is how we defined eligibility. There are real limitations on using um, maternity register data and the reliability accuracy of that data. We understand the limitation, but we were very committed to not adding additional data collection tools that may actually um, introduce a whole nother level of bias. Um, the other area of potential bias that I'm sure you are thinking of is this idea that we only included about 60% of eligible infants. This was because we relied on health workers and community health workers to do the enrollment. Um, so we did do an analysis looking at the outcomes, at least in the facilities, of those that were not um, consented and there was no significant difference when we, when we looked at it by that. Um, also, we did um, exclude any referrals, so the, any births that did, that did not, that were triaged out were not included. And as you all know very well, the impact of the health worker strike during this time was significant and important. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to pass it on back to Felgona um, to continue on with the presentation. Thanks very much. So in summary, our full uh, intervention package reduced combined fresh stillbirth and neonatal mortality among eligible infants from 23.3% to 15.3%. So that is the headlines as uh, Dil is put it. But we thought it is better for us just to spend a little more time just to dive a little deeper onto the, the interventions. So now that we have the results, we want to answer some of the important questions. Next slide. We want to answer some important questions about our package on what was what was what was what were the components, how and why do we think the study intervention package worked. As you will see, this was a complex um, study where not only did we have the interventions as a package. But even looking at each of the single interventions, they were composite uh, in nature. We will share what worked, our challenges, and some of the outcomes of, for each of the interventions. We will share why we think 
the full package of the interventions led to greater impact than would a single uh, intervention. I therefore now want to just invite the, the rest of the um, presenters to the podium. So uh, especially those who are directly involved with each of these interventions to briefly share with us uh, some of those components, the what, how, and why. So we'll uh, start off with Professor Wanyoro and uh, he will hand on the baton to the rest. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you, Furgona, and uh, welcome participants. Uh, as Furgona, as you have heard, we had four interventions and uh, we implemented our first intervention, which was data strengthening across all the sites. At the onsite, uh, uh, onset of the project, we agreed that it was more valuable for our countries and also the facilities if we used existing data sources and strengthened them rather than creating parallel sources uh, for the project. So that is the main thing. That's why we did the data strengthening. And for this data strengthening, we conducted workshops uh, to assure that the providers understood uh, the various indicator definitions and also we standardized the uh, definitions, especially for uh, preterm labor and preterm birds. And this uh, critical uh, 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 in indicators such as uh, GA, the birth weight, and the APGAS calls. Of course, to improve uh, the gestational age assessment, uh, which we know in most of the time is very subjective, uh, we provided pregnancy wheels and tape measures and trained the providers on their use. Our data team made monthly uh, site visits where they corrected uh, birth register data. They reviewed the birth register, uh, register data uh, for completeness and uh, its uh, uh, correct, uh, correctedness and give feedback uh, to the providers. Then the next action we took uh, was to create a data dashboard. And uh, we uh, input aggregated data uh, in the dashboard. And every month we could generate specific uh, uh, site uh, reports, uh, which we encouraged the, the, the providers uh, to view and see how they are improving in as far as uh, preterm uh, uh, deliveries is concerned. Finally, uh, we did uh, data quality assessments, uh, which were basically uh, looking at uh, the, uh, the, the concordance of data across uh, the data sources and gave feedback to the facility uh, and the, the, the other stakeholders. Next. So for data strengthening uh, activities, we targeted uh, the health record officers, and uh, these are basically the custodians of data within the facility. We also targeted the people who generate uh, preterm uh, data, who included the maternity wards and newborn care providers, and also the facility administrators. And all these activities uh, uh, basically amounted to about one to two hours per month per every facility. Next, please. Now, uh, if you look at this uh, slide, uh, uh, which is basically from data, uh, from a res a retrospective uh, review of the patient uh, uh, files uh, before uh, at baseline, basically, you'll see how a problematic gestational age data is. And as you can see, uh, only 85% of um, the last menstrual period is usually recorded in the maternity register. Of course, uh, to make more, the most surprising thing is that when you use the re recorded uh, last menstrual period to calculate uh, the ge approximate gestational age, we found that uh, you the age uh, we had a range where 
some of the gestational age were going to negative uh, weeks. And also we found that some of the gestation, uh, uh, indicated gestational uh, ages would go up to 92 weeks. So you can see how implausible uh, the gestational age uh, uh, calculation using the last menstrual uh, period as indicated in the maternity register is. The other thing is that uh, the matching uh, between calculated uh, gestational age and recorded uh, last menstrual period was only possible uh, to be done in about 30% at uh, the baseline. Next slide, please. Now, this is the other challenge, and I think uh, Fergona has uh, shown a, 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 a slide that contains uh, the record keeping issues. Uh, so you find like in most of our facilities, the record keeping rooms are very disorganized. And uh, what we did so that we could improve the safety and also accessibility of these records, we tried to uh, renovate uh, uh, the uh, record uh, storage rooms as we went al along. And you can see uh, the picture on the right side, how the rooms look like at the moment. Next slide, please. Now, uh, this slide basically is showing us uh, what happened to the uh, various indicators uh, on the issue of compression in the maternity register as we worked uh, uh, during the, the study period. And you can see that all the indicators, the key indicators, at least as time went on, we had a recording of more than 90%. Next, please. Uh, this uh, is uh, a slide uh, that is a process uh, 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 data. So in the middle uh, of, of the study, we looked at the concordance of data as a result of strengthening the, using the data quality assessments. And you can see that over time, uh, the records between the patient uh, chart, the maternity register, and the MOH 711, uh, 711, which is the tool that is used to, re, uh, to report data to uh, the Ministry of Health, the concordance increased significantly as we did our DQAs. Next slide, please. So our second uh, intervention that uh, uh, we implemented across all sites uh, along with the data strengthening uh, was the modified safe childbirth checklist. So what we did is that we took the safe childbirth uh, checklist, which is a tool uh, developed by the World Health Organization to improve maternal and new, uh, newborn outcomes. And we introduced, uh, we adopted this and called it a uh, modified safe uh, 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 childbirth checklist and introduce it within all our facilities. So what we did, of course, with the stakeholders, we aligned uh, uh, the checklist with the national guidelines uh, for the two countries. And we also added a triage uh, post point uh, to it so that this can be used when the woman uh, 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 arrives at the hospital just before admission. This post point was basically to help the uh, providers to identify preterm labors and also identify the candidates who are uh, uh, who could be able to be given antenatal corticosteroids and or early referral. We also ensured there was effective distribution of the checklist within the facility, and uh, towards the end of the study, we incorporated the checklist within the patient chart. Next slide. Now, for this activity, of course, we still targeted uh, the personnel working in the maternity ward and also the newborn units. And the, uh, we, th this amounted still to, one, uh, to two hours per facility. Next slide, please. Now, Review of the process uh, data uh, is shown on this slide. 
And uh, this indicates that compression rates, as you can see, particularly for the first two pulse points. Remember, this was a tool that we were just we had just introduced within the facility. But you can see that the completion of the post points was very impressive, especially uh, for, for, for uh, triage and also the post point on admission. Next, please. So during the process evaluation surveys, uh, these slides indicates that most providers felt that the uh, checklist help them in clinical decision making, especially in identification of a preterm uh, birth, uh, pre-identification of preeclampsia, multiple gestation, and mainly also because many of the facilities could not be able to have a preterm on those cases that needs a referral. Next slide, please. Now, these are some of the insights uh, from uh, the midwives uh, during the implementation process. And like all the uh, tools that are uh, in, uh, introduced, uh, initially they felt that uh, this was extra uh, workload, uh, but of course with familiarization and mentorship, uh, uh, they saw the clinical utility of the checklist. And eventually they said that it facilitated continuity of care, more so during the hard over because they would look at the points that they have, somebody has uh, been able to tick and know that the rest has not been done. Also, it was also seen as a good study for patient charts when the charts ran uh, out of stock and also integration into the patient charts also improved the uptake. Of course, we know just like uh, things like the pathograph, sometimes you may need to incent incentivize uh, and give supporting uh, activity so that there could be uptake of uh, such tools. So I will now introduce Annette, uh, who is a PTBI Kenya study mentor, so that she can discuss for us the that element of our intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Wanyoro. Hi, everyone. So our third intervention was uh, Pronto, which was only introduced in intervention facilities. Uh, Pronto International is a nonprofit organization that designs and implements simulation and team training curriculum. So all programs, uh, include low tech high realistic simulation. And this one we say that we, it was just replicating what happens in real scenario that is in labor world during this simulation. We have also communication and this is among health providers and together with team training. So identification of actionable system change ideas and I'll say that this is during debrief after simulation. Uh, healthcare workers or providers reflect on areas that need improvement. Staff agree on how to work it out as a team and also practice uh, with this after agreeing as a team, they involve the management and then they come up with change ideas. There's also the practice of kind and respectful care and this is to the patient and also companion, which they practice during simulation. So I'll say Pronto have been implemented in 13 countries worldwide. Next. So Pronto activities, we included the training of Pronto mentors who provided bedside mentoring and knowledge reviews during mentorship. We had also standard basic emergency, obstetric, and neonatal care content that we used to mentor, such as preeclampsia, postpartum hemorrhage, neonatal resuscitation, among others. So during mentorship, we emphasized on prematurity-related care practice because the study was about preterm birth. And some of the practices that we used to emphasize 
were assessment of gestation age, identification of preterm labor synergy with modified safe child by checklist use, which have already been informed, and that. And then also, yes, next. So as we can see there, we have the simulation curriculum that is SIMPAC. This is a list describes the topic areas for each of simulation conducted at the facility over the course of the studies. I'll take, for example, we have their SIMPAC 5, huh? which is uh, intrapartum severe preeclampsia with spontaneous preterm that is 35 weeks and vaginal delivery of a floppy baby. So in this scenario, the providers has to manage preeclampsia. They had to manage preterm baby, but, and also neonatal resuscitation in the simulation. So you can see that the focus was on identification and management of preterm labor and birth. As I said, because many simulations were on preterm, as we can see on the list. However, the curriculum also provided variable uh, review and strengthening of related conditions that I've already mentioned, like postpartum hemorrhage, preeclampsia, among others. So this simulation session were tied to our quality improvement activities in order to help identification and provide change ideas that uh, I mentioned earlier. Next. So pronto, we targeted uh, the activities of pronto targeted maternity ward and newborn care providers. And because we were including a quality improvement, then we also had quality improvement mentors. Then the activities amounted to approximately over 58 hours of pronto activities in a facility, then 12 weeks of institute training and mentorship per facility. Next. So as we can see there, that is just an example of uh, process data, video analysis of evidence based during a simulation. When we were doing simulation, we used to take videos. And these videos were taken for analysis. So for example, there we are having the SIMPAC 5, which I've already mentioned, of preeclampsia and floppy baby. So we we saw change, improvement in every activity that was analyzed in the, in the video. This is whereby the staff or the healthcare workers, the providers did this simulation for the first time and it was maybe low. For example, I'll say checking for chest rise, which is in gray, it was a bit low. But after doing the several simulation, after a long period of time, by the end we were doing the last simulation, we can see there was extremely improvement in that. So, and this is all about evidence-based practice. So good improvement in that. Next. So our providers shared that they felt Pronto was different because this training, the training approach, giving knowledge reviews, teamwork, training together with simulation. So they said it is a team oriented that is working together as a team. Then also focus on identification and problem solving because during simulation, what went well, what needs improvement. So with this, what needs improvement, people are like, yeah, we need to do this. So I'll quote what one of the health providers in an intervention facility said where Pronto was. The bad things are going uh, to be corrected. The good things are going to be appreciated after the simulation. So that uh, one has made staff to master how to handle mothers. 
correctly, and it has really changed the situation. Mothers are now coming and are happy, yes. So that is all about Pronto. Now I hand over to Kevin Ashola to continue with the, the next intervention. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much, Annette and the team for uh, the part that has gone. So I'm going to present to us the last intervention, which was quality improvement. So quality improvement was the fourth intervention among the four uh, package, and uh, it was implemented mainly or only in the intervention sites. So the quality improvement collaborative activities are ensured or facilitated creation of facility quality improvement teams that comprised of uh, three to 12 people, uh, depending on the size of the facility. And these teams um, discuss quality improvement projects and follow, uh, they were following plan, do, study, and act cycles uh, with, the, with the help of their quality improvement coach. So we also had uh, tracking of quality, in, quality improvement indicators that uh, uh, most of my colleagues have already mentioned. So the first one was this gestational age documentation in maternity register. So quality improvement would actually look at uh, how far or how well the, the documentation of gestational age was done. We would also look at uh, anti administration of antenatal corticosteroids. Uh, we would also track uh, uh, uptake of kangaroo mother care. And the last uh, indicator that we were tracking uh, was modified safe child, but check his completion. So uh, with the activities going on at the facility, we established country-specific quality improvement collaboratives or learning sessions uh, that took about three to four uh, four to six months. And in these meetings, we uh, discussed quality improvement indicators and the change ideas that were generated at the facility level. So this uh, quality improvement collaboratives ensured that the facilities came together, the intervention facilities came together and they looked at how they were faring on in terms of uh, the quality improvement indicators that we had isolated. Next. So in our quality improvement activities, we targeted a maternity ward and care providers that actually generated uh, the change ideas. We also involved the facility leadership. So this resulted in uh, quality improvement meetings taking place in the facilities every two weeks. In total, we had about five quality improvement learning sessions per country. Next. So we had uh, so many, I mean, I've already indicated that we were tracking uh, many indicators. And I just have an example of a run chart that we did on gestational age documentation. So you can see um, uh, from this graph, we have the baseline median and we also have uh, the intervention or uh, the median that we had uh, during the intervention period. And you can see that there was a very big change, actually moving from below 80% to 100%. And this was because of uh, some of the change ideas that we initiated, like for example, conducting CME on LMP and gestational age. And then we also fixed gestational will at the triage uh, table. Then we also conducted a CME on gestation age assessment. Next. Uh, the other change idea that we had was uh, <clears throat> on kangaroo mother care. And we can see how the kangaroo mother care was looking at at Migori County Referral uh, Hospital before the intervention. 
and doing intervention, we can see what it looks like on the photos that are on the right side. So you can see what change that we made in this specific facility. Next. Next. Uh, the next change idea was on thermal regulation. So we did an experiment at Awandro Sub County Hospital. We measured a temp room temperature in the delivery room where babies were being born, and we actually saw that it was low. So uh, the change idea that was generated was like, why don't we improve the room, the room temperature by laminating the, wall the walls with wooden materials? And so actually there was a lot of improvement in terms of temperature that was there now in the uh, delivery room after the lamination. Next. So what are some of the quality improvement insights? That integration of facility leadership uh, actually catalyzed the changes. Healthcare providers work in isolation from the facility leadership. But if we bring these two together, the change is actually uh, facilitated. The next one is that quality improvement collaborative fostered healthy competition with shared, with shared indicators. That when we brought uh, intervention facilities together in a learning session, so they would actually learn from each other. Like, for example, if decision A documentation in one specific facility was at 100%, then they would actually share what change actually resulted into that good performance. So the other facilities would actually take up that idea and implement it in their own facilities, depending on their context. So we have one quote from a staff, a healthcare provider that we gathered during a process evaluation midway. And it says, it has made, sorry, it has made us gain courage at work and at, and at least we can speak on what is really hindering us and the challenges that we have. Quality improvement, we always involve the administration plus the nurses and the medical officers. Here we talk of the challenges and if all this group, they are around us plus the administration, at least if we speak out what is really pressing us, that we can allow us to work, that can allow us to work well. The administration can take initiative. Next. So I would want to introduce uh, Dr. Felgono again to take over from there. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, I'll put this up again, just to emphasize the power of the intervention package. And this power was based on intentional, intentionally integrating each of these uh, four components. So each of these activities uh, definitely were intentionally made to reinforce each other with a possible enhancement of the overall effect. Next. So moreover, just looking at some few critical factors that we think help to facilitate the implementation of this complex intervention. First, I want to emphasize the issue of visibility. Uh, defining an issue always sparks uh, change. So we were able to name prematurity, and this was a key uh, value to be able to know who are the preterms. This definitely marks the first point uh, of this critical stage in the evolution of achieving the gains that were made. Secondly was teamwork, which also ran across all the interventions. And uh, this helped to establish, um, with, within the study, we were able to establish uh, regional peer networks for providers and facilities. And that really created more confident uh, team uh, more accountability for each of the staff and uh, more uh, support from the, you know, from each other. And so we end up with a community that is more responsive and more committed and more confident. And lastly um, was the issue of engagement. 
So the project uh, began by in engaging the Ministry of Health, which is very important at a stakeholder level, and then relying on the local uh, leadership uh, where the studies were implemented, and also having dissemination uh, throughout the study period, and even at the end, and this has been continuous uh, up to date, the issue of disseminating the results. Uh, so all these variables working together help to create an environment where the opportunity, uh, this motivation, this technical knowledge and skills coalescing together to uh, improve the outcomes that we were able to see. Next. So this is just to illustrate the, the circular um, uh, way of looking at it because the, each of these uh, components are feeding onto each other, naming the condition, increase the visibility of the problem, teaching providers, increase their capacity and confidence. And uh, we know that all these things happened, but then um, looking at it, we, we feel strongly that they are all really feeding into each other in a circular fashion. Next. So this is just to throw in the fact that uh, today we have been able to share uh, our primary outcome, but we do have, uh, and we have actually published this, you can read it from the Global Lancet, but we do have uh, very rich data. So we feel that we are going to be able to to dive in to look at several other components uh, to do with the, the you know, referral, to do with growth and development of the preterms, to do with C-sections and the like. So uh, I think of interest also for sustainability. We are also looking at uh, cost and cost effectiveness analysis, which we will be able to share uh, in the near future. We also had several sub-studies which we feel will strongly triangulate into what we already have. And this will just be able to uh, give more um, prominence to how we can save and strengthen the, the quality of care uh, for preterms. Next. Next slide. So I would like just to conclude now by also giving a quote, a very strong quote from one of our healthcare officials uh, that the success story for us here is that the facility has a preterm se section. The first one of its kind here, mothers are now happy that even if they deliver preterm babies, chances of going home with a live baby are high. The mothers of preterm babies had no hope before preterm birth initiative project, but now they have hope. And lastly, um, for me, I would like next slide, just to uh, strongly acknowledge and appreciate the opportunity and the support that we had to conduct this study by thanking the sponsor, the Bill Melinda Gate Foundation, our very strong preterm birth initiative advisory boards, both um, in the US and locally, and also our county officials and the Ministry of Health we also want to thank uh, the participants and the research team. So I would like now just to um, take this back uh, to Dr. Nelly to take us through the rest of the discussions. Thank you. All right, so we are back to me. Um, I think we'd asked if people would, um, Keep posting your questions on the chats. But for the next part, we're going to listen to our panelists. And um, in case of Professor Rachel Musoke, we have Dr. Mary Wayego, neonatologist from Kenyatta National Hospital, will be joining us. So um, I think Dr. Inwani was also held up. I think we have Dr. Dalton on Marlo. So I'd like to invite our able panelists, if you would unmute and uh, give us some of your reflections 
from the presentation today. I'd like to start by welcoming Professor Edwin Were. And all the panelists you see here were members of the PTBI advisory team. So they're very conversant with the, with the whole project, step by step. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Mugo, for the opportunity to present my reflections on this study. First of all, I want to thank the study leads, the PIs and the protocol chairs for giving me the opportunity to be part of the advisory board. I think it is instructive that um, the study has demonstrated significant reduction in the you know mortality at 28 days and in my view a 34 percent reduction is quite significant and of uh, public health significance and i think we want to con congratulate the team on this positive outcome um, next i want to say that what the study you know, the study approach was very interesting. It was as interesting as it was complex in the sense that majority of the interventions, not even majority, all of the inventions are actually things that uh, ought to be done on a regular basis as standard of care in any clinical care setting. There needs to be um, clinical competence and that was um, addressed by the pronto training. There needs to be some mechanism of flagging, um, you know, cases that require special treatment or triaging. And that was um, addressed by the, you know, the safe uh, care checklist. Uh, there also needs to be good data because data for decision making is the current mantra. And then lastly, there is need for quality assurance. And in my view, the whole package was anchored on quality assurance because all these issues could not have worked well without uh, a robust quality assurance uh, mechanism. But embedded in all this is the fact that for one to have this kind of um, standard of care being um, implemented in settings such as Migori that we saw as we went around during some of our meetings, uh, there's need for buy-in at all levels. And I think the study team did that very well by first of all, uh, focusing the interventions on matters that were of immediate importance, not only to the country, but also to the county of me and then bringing in the uh, ministries of health at those levels then the facility leadership then the you know the clinical care providers that level of buy-in is actually something that is a must do in these kinds of, of of things and so as we reflect on this i think the message that i want to put across is that if we forget anything else we need to have a buy-in in all implementation in um, sectors such as uh, health sector where there are so many stakeholders and so many important uh, players. I want to leave it at that point and give it to my co-panelists to say a word or two. Over to you, Neil. Thank you, Prof. Um... I just realized that my video was off. I'm not camera shy, so I'm back. Um, and I'd like to thank you for those comments. I'd like to invite Dr. Wayego. All right, uh, good evening. From, um, from the study, there were some observations that were made around um, you know, the newborn at, at that point. And um, what was, what, what, what came, you know, came to front is that sometimes, and actually most times, um, 
when planning and, and, and trying to get um, facilities that are specific to the newborn, um, there is sometimes no representation so that uh, what is obtained is appropriate for the term, but not necessarily for the preterm um, newborn. So we know that uh, globally there might be, you know, problems around um, technologies and equipment that is specific and that has been validated for the for the preterm newborn. But even uh, with that, there is also the feeling that there is that gap that um, sometimes the people taking care of the of the preterm and the and the you know and the newborn babies do not you know are not on the table where the decisions around what needs to be procured and what needs to be obtained that is going to be specific for this uh, for these babies they there might also be an issue around you know planning so that there is goals that needs to be achieved and what needs to go around those goals so that um, the right things are obtained. So I think what comes um, what comes out clear is that uh, the people that are mandated to take care of these uh, preterm and and, and the term babies, the newborn at those uh, those first days of life, needs to need to be part um, of of these um, teams. You know, the, they need to come to the front and be part of the teams that are making decisions on what needs to be changed and what needs to be obtained and and so that they can give advice and give um, the information on what is appropriate and appropriate most importantly for the for the preterm for the term sometimes what works for the child may work for the term but it may not necessarily work for the preterm um, for the preterm neonate the other thing that was also coming to the front is that there is a general feeling of fear of handling this fragile, you know, the, the preterm, the fragile um, newly born babies and in their first days of life. But uh, the people from the study who, you know, who are, who are participants or midwives and, and clinical officers, so that there is, a, there is a, what comes is that we there, there is need for, for trying to to demystify this care of the newly borns and the newborns so that you know people overcome those fears and they get the skills and I think what 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 needs to be brought forth is that really. Um, when we do the basics right, like this study has shown, the the implications are, are enormous. So, for example, things around you know the newborn resuscitation, to just make people aware that really the, it's a skill that can be learned and you know can be perfected, and and anyone who gets the privilege to to work around um, mothers who are birthing and delivering can actually do that. You know, those are the basic things that involve things that improve um, on the newborn care, thermoregulation, IPC, initiating breastfeeding, kangaroo mother care. So just empowering the people that are, are on the ground because it's not all facilities that participated in this had those highly specialized people to do these things but just that demystification and showing that it's skills that can actually be learned and 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 people can make an improvement and and can you know make an impact and, and improve on outcomes of these babies so there is uh, there is need for for those not really simplified, but available guidelines that, you know, people that are on the lower level facilities can follow and, and mentorship so that they acquire these skills and keep them and improve on them. So with regards to, 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 to the newborn, those were some of the observations that um, 
came out. Yeah, uh, thank you. I take it back to Dr. Nelly. Thank you. And, uh, and I just note it's also karaoke way ago. Eh? Thank you yes. very much. Thank you for those comments. I had in one of the presentations from one of the implementers uh, in the facilities. They said the nurse work is working. And that's what we call it. Yeah. They like to work with what they had, not what they wished they had. And you know, reducing mortality by ourselves is the next it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Waka Oscar. Uh, the, the dog just missed your welcome. Uh, good good evening, members. Hello, good evening. Good evening. And today you can take a break from COVID. So welcome to the panel. Thank you very much. I actually, I had, uh, I'm having a problem with my internet. So I was yeah, not actually are. following up there. Hello? You're clear. You're very clear. Yes, and my video is not working, so I want to apologize. So, uh, Dr. Nelly, what is uh, what did you say? Hello, Dr. Nelly. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? I I I, I was asking what you said. Oh no, we, we are just asking for your reflection on the Preterm Birth Initiative work and outcome. Okay. Know, this okay. program. As far as, uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, to the entire team who have organized for this webinar. Uh, and thanks to also all the members who have joined. Uh, first of all, uh, from uh, where we sit, the same I think uh, we are on the right perspective. Uh, from where we stand, is uh, it's really a concern when it comes to uh, uh, pre pre prematurity issues in the country and the death actually from pre preterm births. So uh, it's quite an issue. Uh, even the data which are coming from the field sometimes are uh, not the correct data. So what we did one time is we were trying to actually critically on a monthly basis check on newborn deaths, including preterm deaths. And uh, we came to realize that uh, about 800 to 900 babies actually were dying uh, countrywide. But this was not been reflected in the data which were coming to the Kenya Health, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the HIS, the DHIS. So we, crit we are critically, we gave ourselves some assignments that monthly we report the correct data. So that is calling the counties, calling the district the health information office desks. And uh, that is the data we are getting of between 800 and 900 deaths uh, monthly. But we could see what was being captured in the normal uh, data issues was uh, about 200, 300, or 300. So that led us now to what can we do next? And uh, we had to see what uh, uh, BTBI and the partners were doing in Migori and the Pongoma. And uh, we were asking the counties, uh, for those who can, uh, and the counties, and improve uh, the outcome of new uh, birth in the country. So thank you. I think that's what I wanted to respond. And I thank the PTBI team, uh, uh, the University of 
California, San, San Francisco for uh, giving us all the support to improve the newborn data in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Osman. I think it's true if you, you know, from the implementation package that the role of um, the administrative structures was really, really important. I mean, just something as simple as making sure that the temperature is right in the delivery room. Small, small, big things. So Dr. Wapa, we appreciate the support and we hope to have more scale up of the interventions which were identified in PTBI. Now, I know Dr. Enwan is not with us. Um, will we have Dr. Dalt, Professor Malwa? Dr. Nelly, uh, yes. yes can, now that Dr. Nguyen is there, can I uh, say one or one, can I add one, two, one or two things? Yes. Uh, I think uh, thanks to the PTBI team, uh, we stayed to scale up. It's really uh, an approach we used. Uh, what we used for like KMC, K KMC scale up, what we wanted to call a C1, a do one and a teach one approach. Uh, with the support of PTBI team, a team which was composed of the National MOH and uh, the University of Nairobi uh, team, we went to Migori and uh, we saw all the things which were presented. Uh, the renovation at KMC, uh, Kangaroo Mother Care Awards, and also the newborn units awards. Uh, so we came back and actually gave our presentation to the National MOH and also the Council of Governors, some of the CH, uh, uh, they are called the County Executive Com Committee members of health. And some of them, we encourage them to go and see for themselves what was happening in Migori and Bogoma. And uh, with the support of UNICEF, we converted the uh, money to Mwani Hospital to be a center of excellence for newborn care and uh, KMC. And uh, I remember about 15 counties were brought to, to Mwani maternity and they were trained on newborn care so that they saw what was happening in Mwani and they were asked to go and translate uh, uh, what they saw in the money in their counties through a mentorship program uh, like the prototype so that now they were able to move now from the county headquarters now to the sub-county, sub-county hospitals. So they started small in the county hospitals and uh, on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis they will go back to, I mean they will go down to the sub county hospitals see how far they have implemented uh, or improved newborn care and, uh, and uh, KMC, including the use of the data. How have they improved their data? Using the data collection tools, that is the KMC registers and the newborn registers, which were developed by the newborn unit at the MOH headquarters. So there was a bit of data improvement there was a bit of better recording and uh, even the use of uh, mobile mobile uh, uh, gadgets to be reporting on data. So thank you. That's actually what I wanted to add. I think um, my fellow PTA investigators would actually laugh on that because for any research you do once they move into implementation, then that becomes a success story that you've done more than just um, proving an intervention. Thank you very, very much for sharing that. Huh? And I, you've actually answered a question that has come up that says, um, how, this, how can this package be replicated inside or even the approach replicated in areas? And I really love the question because it's the power of implementation science, that if we can use what we know and use it well, we can make big differences. Um, 
but you know, good training, good records, and um, Dr. Felgona, you can comment on this. I remember there were times there'd be no files in a facility, in a health center. So even the issue of records, when there's no paper, no files provided, very, very basic things. Um, keeping a room warm enough. Uh, tidiness, filing, is there a cabinet to keep those files so that they're easily retried? And I think if we can, if the administrative team can work with the clinical teams, usually we can find good solutions. So I, I truly think this can be replicated everywhere. And I don't know, Dr. Dill, Prof, uh, uh, Dr. Dillis, do you want to talk a little bit about the pronto simulation? Because I've seen similar things in emergency care which is also being taught with simulation. So I think whichever field you're in, we can make a difference. Maybe yeah, to I, answer that. Mm -hmm. I will just comment very briefly. I think that, um, you know, Pronto is now working in 10, 12 countries. And what we've recognized is more important than the curriculum, meaning what is it about, whether it's preterm birth or hemorrhage or preeclampsia, more important than the actual topic area is the capacity of the mentors to actually conduct the simulation, to set it up, to run it effectively, and probably most importantly, learning how to run a debrief in which the participants really do self-reflection. And it's not about going to a simulation and making sure you go through the drill and know what to do. It's much more about exploring what are the challenges and obstacles within your setting that make it difficult to do what you know you're supposed to do and exploring how to um, meet those challenges. So I, I, the simulation piece, I would just urge everyone to think of it, not so much about preterm birth, but about a strategy that could be used for almost any um, clinical event that occurs within a facility and the value of doing it in the facility um, is important and very different than doing things in skills labs. Yeah, which, which is a reminder, actually, that a lot of trainings happen in labs, in hotels and outside facilities, but the most important training is the one that takes place in the facility. Um, I wonder if um, I could ask Dr. Onyoro to talk to us about the QI, because as in response to this question, the issue of C Act Revise is, was an important part um, of this training? Or was it Kevin who talked a lot about QI processes? Anthony Wanyaro? As, as Kevin maybe comes on board, I can comment. The main thing about QI is the, the issue of identifying gaps and acting on them uh, uh, through the PDSA cycles and uh, the, uh, learning from uh, the facility, the other people through collaboratives. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we introduced or we got uh, the honor to uh, introduce uh, the issue of having QI collaboratives, which have worked very well in other, uh, uh, other, other countries. And I think this was one of the key uh, critical area. Uh, with the QI uh, uh, activities. Maybe Kevin can add something on it. <clears throat> Maybe Kevin, you can talk to Thank us. You Professor Onyora and Professor Nelly. <clears throat> about the adaptability. How, how easy was it to get facilities to take up the PDSA cycle? Yeah. Uh well, what I must admit is that my experience was that quality improvement activities were not really naive to the facility. Facilities already had some ideas, but the daily functionality of these quality improvement teams was actually very minimal. So it needed leadership to come in strongly and perhaps uh, just institutionalizing uh, quality improvement both at the county level, the sub-county level, and finally at the facility level. Because without the leadership improvement. I, I can 
that is you are by leadership okay. response. To give is the issue of referral. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Hello. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Hello, am I audible? Can yes. I be heard? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. So, so I'm saying. Yeah, so I'm saying that um, quality improvement in in our facility sometimes is there, but it's very dormant. So it needs the process needs to be catalyzed right from the county level to sub county, then at the facility leadership level. Without leadership coming in strongly, I think uh, staff fatigued by perhaps small issues that need to be addressed, for example, like referral, be delay in referral systems. Um, if leadership is not there, they actually get fatigued and it's like, what can we do? Uh, in some of our learning collaboratives, you could actually see um, that coming out, being communicated clearly by the staff. But even if you leave alone something like uh, referral, they are lying fruits that can be picked at the facility level, like one of the healthcare workers has actually indicated that perhaps you don't need the county director to come down to the facility, but the mind of the facility staff needs to be changed so that they can see the little effort that they can make to bring change at the facility level. So I think that's briefly what I could say, because the, the quality improvement systems are already in place in some of the facilities and I think there's also a national guideline on quality improvement. So we just need to have the, the, uh, the guideline catalyzed at the facility level. Okay, one I want to comment about the large audience. There's a point it had gone over 400. It's really excellent to know that we've disseminated that widely and that we value and love our babies this much. I've seen my colleague Dan, Dan Okoro You've made a comment, maybe you can tell us from UNFPA about the scale up efforts and how far those are going and how far you see them going. Um, I don't know if we can unmute or I don't know if we can actually hear. Yeah, I've, un I've unmuted him. You should oh, be able good. to, yeah. Dr. Okoro? is a gynecologist, obstetrician gynecologist working with the UNFPA. Maybe it's not, um, just shout out when you're ready. There's another comment that says, talks Can to I us. Uh -huh. Let me say something uh, in relation to what Dan had uh, commented and uh, asked whether the county was able to scale or replicate this beyond the study sites. And um, I think the answer is yes, uh, to some extent. The Migori County has been able to uh, keep uh, some components of the interventions and uh, have been able to scale them to the non-study site. So I think the answer is yes. So the whole issue of uh, buy-in as what Prof. Edwin was talking about took a uh, place in Migori quite well, and we are very happy with, with what they are doing. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Fabrona. Um, Ibrahim Mohammed has reminded us about the, he said it was interactive, though the net is problematic, but kangaroo mother care is an important aspect of practice, the cascading to facilities, hygiene, nutrition, skin to skin. And I think we couldn't agree more. Um, it was very nice to see that fathers also participated in kangaroo mother um, baby care. It should be parent care, I guess. But I also want, and I, as I leave other members of our team to comment on this, is that the providers alone cannot do this. The administration must be on board. When, when, the, when the delivery rooms are cold, when heaters don't work during wet months, when the bulbs are burnt and not replaced, those things can, can be very expensive and they can cost babies' lives. So um, as we come to near close time, maybe I'll let my colleagues um, additional comments and then 
We'll have Dr. John Kinodia make a final comment. So I'll pause for any, any more additional comments from the panelists, co-investigators. One of our co-investigators not with us today, and I just want to mention her name is Dr. Lea Kirumbi, who worked closely with the Pronto Implementation Team in Kenya. Maybe I can just make a small comment on the issue of data. I think uh, for us uh, as investigators and researchers, uh, it is important that uh, when we go to do research, uh, we try not to create uh, parallel systems. Uh, it is good uh, to strengthen uh, the data systems within the facilities as much as possible, because what you realize is that most of the data that uh, the Ministry of uh, Health gets uh, from the facilities in most of the times, it may not be the real uh, situation as Dr. Wafa has said. So if we are to use the system that exists as we did and try to uh, 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 strengthen and uh, use that, those systems for our data, then that uh, becomes very important and you leave a legacy within the facilities. Thank you. I think that's a really important point, eh? not to overburden facilities with, with, uh, with data collection. Dr. Onyoro, you know, your slide talked about the gestational age of minus 14 to 91. Eh? Sure. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you can't imagine it. So you can imagine the level of error. Exactly. And as any other additional comments before I hand over to our host, Dr. John Kinodia. So on that note, from my end, I want to truly deeply thank all the investigators, all the collaborators and sponsors of the PTBI project. I want to thank all of you, our 369 listeners who are still with us and the others who had to drop off. This was a tremendous effort. And I must say that 30 plus percent change was a wonderful thing to see. And it's our hope and desire that there'll be scale up and that these changes will be realized beyond Migori and the implementation facilities and that more mothers will go home with babies who are alive. So on that note, um, I can hand over to our colleague and friend, Dr. John Kenodi at Kenya International Hospital, and our host. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nelly. And uh, you have summarized everything so wonderfully that I don't really have much to say other than to just, uh, re just uh, reiterate my thanks to, uh, to you for ably moderating this session, to the PT uh, PTBI team for coming to share their very important findings, which can make a big difference to the panelists, Professor Were, Dr. Wafa, Dr. Oyego, thank you so much. And to all the participants who have joined this session uh, late in the evening. Thank you so much and uh, keep on the lookout. We'll have more sessions coming up. Thank you again. Good night. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Good day. Good night. Good day, everyone. Good night.